Hello, everybody, and welcome along to the first episode of the Telegraph Rugby podcast, which, to deliberately misquote the famous slogan, is exactly what it says on the tin. I'm Ben Coles, the Telegraph's rugby reporter, and over the next month during the Autumn Internationals, we'll be releasing a podcast each week. I'm joined here in the studio by Charlie Morgan, the Telegraph's senior rugby writer, and Charles Richardson, the Telegraph's rugby reporter. Um, this week's theme is going to be looking at the art of selection, and Charlie, I know you've been recently to see Eddie Jones himself, who we're going to be hearing from later in the podcast. What did he sort of tell you about selection? What did you learn? I learned from my... Um very delicately crafted first question that's both an art and a science They're different things different facets that he considers um and then a lot about the social side of it i think that was kind of what what came across but really interesting somebody that's done it for so long at a professional level at the highest level for um so long and also framed around world cups quite heavily too charles you're uh, you're just back from scotland mm. uh, how was it and tell us about your uh, hotel view yeah it was lovely yeah what a stonking hotel. Hot and cold running water. And a bed. No window, though. Um, yeah, so it was a bit prisony. Um, it was my own fault due to its proximity to Murrayfield. I booked it. In hindsight, I found out that it was 5.6 on booking.com. Check in 4 p.m., check out 10 a.m. So, you know, I think that says a lot. You know, you couldn't even spend a long time there, but that's getting a bit. Annie Hall, you know, I'm. Um, the food here is terrible in such small portions. The good thing is you've admitted to booking it yourself, and you're not yeah. you're not pinning the blame on anyone else. No, no, it was all all my own doing, it, um, and I shan't be going back. It's all on you. Can we also talk about um, shirt names for a second? Because there, it's been a, a story last week that Scotland and England are, are going to have shirt names on the back of their shirts during this autumn campaign. I guess the only a caveat is: will you be able to read the shirt names because they were quite small, weren't they, in the Scotland game? Um, yeah, by the, by the look of things, the England ones from the pictures that we've seen are bigger, but the Scotland ones were shambolic, for, for want of a better phrase. You know, you could barely see them. The BT logo was larger than the name of, than the name below it, and it was really a historic moment. Apparently, for Test rugby, was um, well very underwhelming. That was the game itself. We should probably touch on that before we move on to um, other things. Yeah, it was well. It was it was entertaining. It was it was a, it was a dramatic finish, obviously, with um, Kinghorn um, Blair Kinghorn missing that missing that penalty right at the death, and a, a tremendous grubbered twenty two dropout from um, Nick White sealing the deal at the end for Australia. Um, I thought Australia were better ball in hand. Certainly, um, Gregor Townsend alluded as alluded as much after the game in the first half. He thought that Scotland played within themselves a bit, um, and then got better as the game went on. I, I would agree with that. I think Australia are very neat and tidy, ball in hand, they are inventive and they do have danger runners, they're just lacking a bit of oomph, a bit of firepower really, I think when when they're, um, when they're starting 15, when, when someone gets injured in the starting 15, they, they struggle for depth a little bit, um, but I think on their day, as they showed in the Rugby Championship, they can trouble anyone and there'll be a... I think France will beat them this weekend, but I don't think it'll be plain sailing for them. Mm, for sure. So Scotland and Australia kicked off the Autumn Nations series, but now everybody gets a go uh, this weekend. England face Argentina on Sunday. Charlie, you were in Jersey last week. Uh, did you have a nice time? I had a lovely time. Thanks for asking. That's okay. I just I just want to make sure you enjoy these trips. And what, what did you what did you sort of make of how the squad are going? What what sort of became apparent speaking to players and coaches? If it's not too fluffy a way to start, they seem to really enjoy one another's company. I think that reset that um, Eddie Jones has undergone um, kind of a year or so ago, that seems to be like a tangible thing. It seems to be a lot of young leaders, um, people like Marcus Smith, people like Ellis Genge, who've really kind of imparted that their personality on the group. And then now um, you're seeing sort of the more... Uh, experienced guys come back in and influence things in their own way. Um, I think it's it's just been such a funny year for England, hasn't it? Whereby we haven't really been able to find out anything too um, too important about them. There's been sort of they've flattered to deceive in a few games. They've had big um, moments like Charlie Yule's red card, where you can't really judge the kind of remaining game. Um, so I think this autumn we take another step towards that, but. Everything is so, um, so kind of um, framed by the World Cup that it does. It does feel like now with um, with 
Manitou Lagi, Owen Farrell and um, Marcus Smith there. We're going to find out about the first choice midfield. I think with injuries, a lock's got to emerge um, just because of the way the caps have fallen. A scrum half has to emerge. Um, so, yeah, big, big questions. And as ever, kind of a really intriguing set of games for England. Yeah, I'd go with that. There, there is that vibe, isn't there, that we don't really know what we have yet with England. I almost think Eddie Jones wants it to be that way as well. The, when we've spoken to him in recent weeks, he's sort of hinted that he's holding stuff back, hasn't he, for the World Cup and that we don't quite know what he's going to be like or what this team is going to be like. So there, defi- there does seem to be that aura, doesn't there? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, I was, I was saying earlier that I think they're struggling for an identity a little bit in England and I think this could be a key a key run of games for them this autumn and certainly into the Six Nations. I know Eddie said that he wants to keep his cards close to his chest for the Rugby World Cup and and fair play to him if that if that is a gamble that, that, that pays off. But I think at the minute, certainly, when you look at the two best teams in the world, France and Ireland, they have really strong identities. They have a really clear vision about how they want to play. We could sit here now and say, we know Ireland are very strong at X, Y and Z. We know France are strong at X, Y and Z. We know France kick the ball lots. We know they like to counter. We know they're very strong at the breakdown. At the minute, with England... What are the major strengths? What is the identity of the team? And I think this is a crucial five weeks for, for England and Eddie to sort of really stamp out an identity ahead of the, the World Cup in 2023. Absolutely. How many, how, many, how many bases do they cover? How many bases do they cover really, really well? Um, it'd be really good to get answers to those two questions, I think. Let's touch on the injuries because there's a few and it felt like we were getting squad updates every couple of days last week with new players getting called up. So Courtney Laws... What's the latest with him? Doesn't seem very positive at all. So Northampton have confirmed that he, just to take you behind the curtain, we're sort of recording this a few hours before a squad update, but Courtney Laws, um, um, Northampton have confirmed that he's still suffering a few concussion symptoms. Luke Cowan-Dickey was training in units last week and it's hoped that he takes a full part in training this week. Um, Owen Farrell missed Jersey like Laws did. Um, but has worked through is working through concussion return to play cro- protocols after being knocked out against Exeter, and the the sounds are a little bit more positive um, surrounding him. Certainly, um, he's been involved in the camp, kind of with video calls and, and a bit like that. So, um, I'd expect him to be named uh, later today and actually to have a pretty central role. It feels a bit more doubtful with Laws, and um, Luke Kandik is a bit of a, a bit of a doubt as well. It's not. It's not ideal sort of preparation, is it? Not having laws and, and sort of Farrell being out for a bit. I mean, we're we're hoping that Farrell's going to be back, aren't we? I think let's let's sort of because this is an episode about selection and the art of selection. We should probably look at what the biggest selection dilemmas are, for England, and we're going to go through later and pick our own teams. But it would seem that captaincy is the immediate one, isn't it? With no mm. Courtney Laws, so who do you feel is going to be the captain when England face Argentina on Sunday? I think if Farrell's there, he does it. And then if it and then it'd be between Curry and Genge. The two guys well, Curry's done it before. Genge has been a kind of set as I said earlier, a central figure with it a central leader within this kind of revamp. I think a lot of what we're what we know and what we're anticipating from England hinges on this really unusual situation that they're in, which is a coach going through to going towards the second towards the end, sorry, of his second World Cup cycle, which is a really odd situation to mm. be in because and when you couple that with the fact that England have got this vast player pool, Eddie Jones has settled combinations everywhere that he can fall back on. And I just feel like this last bit of this second World Cup cycle has been about exploring the ceiling and exploring the individuals that can take England to that n- next level when they are embedded in a team with settled combinations around it. We'll talk about the kind of um, the individuals within it all later, but someone like Freddie Stewart, he has already embedded and now they're just seems to be no question marks whatsoever about a guy who's a year into his test career, which is remarkable. Yeah, and Eddie, you know, Eddie has has bemoaned the lack of leadership candidates in his in his England squad before, hasn't he? And it, it does feel like that you know is is pertinent now. You know, he said that he doesn't think that the, the sort of public school emphasis that we have in, in English rugby and English schoolboy rugby here helps mould leaders. And it does feel a little bit like that because if, if Laws isn't there and, and, and he seems to have hung his hat on Laws as captain, then it and then it's Farrell who, you know, he, he you know, the, the truth is that he stripped Farrell of the captaincy. So he's either got to hand the captaincy back to Farrell, or after that, the candidates are slim. Ellis Genge, you know, captained Leicester superbly last season, but but the truth is that he is a bit still potentially at, at international level, perhaps 
a rough diamond and a bit of a hothead, or at least he might still have that in him, despite how much he's matured. Um, and, and and Tom Curry doesn't captain his club, so it's a it's a, it's a bit of a strange one, really, in terms of in terms of leadership candidates. I think it has to be Farrell if if, um, if Laws isn't fit, and and Farrell is. Okay, so ahead of us picking our England teams later, let's hear more from Eddie Jones himself about the art of selection, speaking to Charlie Morgan. Hi, Eddie. Welcome to the Telegraph Rugby Podcast. Um, thanks, first of all, for taking the time. Thanks, Charlie. Good um, to be here, mate. Great. We want this first episode to shed some light on the art of selection. So, first of all, tell us, is it an art rather than a science? Uh, well, I've just been reading a, a, a really good book on on decision making by Ed Smith, um, where he talks about the fact that selection is always a combination of of your intuition, which is your art and your gut feeling, and and the context of the selection, but also that now data analytics, the information that's available to select players is immense, and the way you're able to use that information plus your intuition. Um, is the best decision making or possibly the best decision making. So I tend to agree with Ed Smith um, that it's a combination of not only the art but the science. We're sitting in Jersey, we're probably 10 months away from you naming your final 33 for 2023. After almost seven years with this team, where do you feel as far as the selection of that 33? I don't know, we've got a pretty good idea, but we'd love two or three players to come from nowhere, basically jump out of the bush there and say, pick me. Um, and that would add, add to the, the depth of selection, but we've got a pretty good idea of, of what we need for the World Cup and, and who's available and, and where they sit in the, the hierarchy of selection. You, you clearly relish World Cups. Is, is that partly because of how stren strenuously the skill of selection is, um, is tested at those tournaments? Um, well, I think I enjoy the World Cups because all the best players are playing and you usually get the best players in their best condition. Yeah, it's a once in the four years, particularly in the Northern Hemisphere, you've got players who are well prepared for the World Cup. And, and, and the greatest challenge is always to get selection right um, because there's always maybe four or five quite difficult selections. You know, you might have media favourites that's something that you've got to be uh, strong not to get swayed by the media and by, and by the fans and, and, and make sure you pick the best players. Because the best players aren't necessarily the best player in that position. You know, we're picking a, a team to play together and players have to have complementary skills and there's complementary personalities, complementary characters to make up a team that, that is so interdependent. You know, the beauty of our game is that rugby is such an interdependent game. It's not, a, it's not a game where you've got a Messi or a Ronaldo can win the game for you. It's a game that's dependent on the forwards doing their job and getting the ball forward and then the backs making sure that they use that ball well and conversely in defence. So it's quite a complex, complex equation. Can I pick you up on not getting swayed by media and, and fan infatuation? What's that process like, blocking out noise? Uh, well, for me, it's, it's easy because I don't read any of it. Um, but obviously people you've seen it pass before. it on to you. Um, and, and you've just got to make sure you, you, you're very resolute in, in picking your selections on the information that is right. Yeah, and sometimes the fans in the media can love a player and he can be a really good player. But in terms of the composition of the team, sometimes he's not the right fit. Could you pick an example, not somebody that, some, a player that you've overseen or something where you, potentially you've seen that in another sport maybe? Yeah, well, I, I remember back with Australia, there was a clamour to pick Peter Hewitt, uh, who was a prolific try scorer for the Waratahs. Um, but we didn't pick him um, because we felt that at the test level, there was a gap between what he could do at club level and what's needed at test level. Um, and we got widely criticised for that and there's been other examples in England that are, are probably uh, pretty, pretty uh, evident. What are the unique challenges of being an England selector? You've got a big player pool, you've got a lot of clubs, you've got a lot of opinions. Uh, that there's a lot of players around the same ability. 
that's the thing I've found in England. Um, when you're dealing with a smaller player pool as, as Australia and, and uh, Japan, the distinction between your best players and the next best players is pretty, pretty strong. Um, and probably England and South Africa are very similar, that there's a number of players around the same level and therefore you know, some of the other external factors come in, such as the way they contribute to a team. That's really interesting. Um, if you could go back to 2015, December 2015 then, what advice would you give yourself about dealing with the unique challenges that arise for an England selector with that um, issue that you're talking about there? Oh, well, you've got to, you've got to, got to know the, the competition really well. You know, I spend from Friday to Sunday basically on the road looking at games live. You know, I think one of the most important things of selection is, is watching players live. And I, I always try to watch the players by myself, so I don't want to get, get uh, influenced by even an assistant coach or my own view of the player. You know, I watch how they warm up. I watch how they walk off at half time, I watch how they speak to the players. None of those things which you can see on the television and they're such important small parts of the game. When you when you arrive at those premiership games, do you have a player in mind? Are you ever blown away so much that your assignment changes while you're at a game? Ah, uh, definitely. Um, well, they're the ones you like, mate. You go to a game thinking, I'm going to watch Carl Sinclair and then some other guy comes out of the, out of the black... Uh, back blocks that you haven't seen before and they're the delights, you know, they're the treasures. Can you give me an example of that? Oh, well, the one player that stands to mind for me um, is Henry Arundel. Like, I watched him the first time and I thought, goodness me, this kid's going to be a player. You know, first ball he got, he dropped cold. Like, it was like, I throw you the ball now and he dropped it. And I'm thinking, oh, well... Maybe he's not as good as people say he's. And the next time he gets the ball, he's got such confidence. He chips, kicks, scores, and then wins an impossible game for London Irish against Was. So, yeah, when you see those sort of players that just come out and say, pick me, that's the most wonderful experience. You spoke about um, data at the top of this. And uh, I think a thing that now will go alongside that is a lot of due diligence surrounding the character um, references and things like that. What's that process like to you? What does it look like? Uh, well, the, the data, we have a, a company that does all the data in terms of selection, uh, rates the players, has weightings for rates. Like again, you know, if I, if I go back to the Ed Smith, that if you score, say a team scores four for 800, right, and you get 150, whereas every other player gets 200, like your 150 is not a heavy weighting. And it's like when we watch players in rugby, like... If you're playing against the bottom four teams, I tend to discount those games um, because the level of the opposition is not strong enough and therefore the top four games, in my mind, I don't have an equation for it, but are more heavily weighted in terms of selection. And that's, again, something maybe the media and the fans miss. You know, When you're playing against the top four and, and European Cup games against the best sides in France, they're the real selection games. That's when it starts to to really heat up. Best sides in South Africa now as well. Sorry? Best sides in South Africa yeah, now as well. Yeah, 100%, which is going to be even better. Um, you're in between picking a player and then taking the field for you. There's a, there's a small gap where I guess there must be a special sort of anticipation and, and thrill where there is just this moment of the unknown where you've made a decision and you're kind of waiting to see how it plays out. What's that thrill like? Uh, yeah, no, it is a, it's one of the most exciting parts of the game. You know, you, you know, we're bringing a young bloke like Alex Coles into the squad now and you see him at his club, you see him performing for his club, but his ability then to adapt to a, a different, much different environment, much more a higher pace because we're trying to do what most teams do in six weeks, in five days here. So there's, there's a lot more unknown for the player and how they adapt to the unknown is one of the the most exciting things because you want to see players grow you know and again you know one of my probably favorite selections has been Ellis Genge and Sinclair you know that we picked them out in 2016 as rough diamonds that we thought could make it and see both of those guys mature you know Sinclair's been a, a Lions and, and Genge has been an England captain 
to see those guys do that and then keep maturing now is one of the most most pressurable things of selecting, mate. Sounds like Alex Cole's going all right then. Ah, uh, he's going pretty well. Yeah, no, pretty well. What what are the, what are the qualities that allow players to be to take on that information and, and to step up? Uh, well, it's a little bit about their their character. Um, you know, I like self assured players that come in the environment and are just themselves and just adapt adapt quickly. If they're very uh, programmed or robotic players, then sometimes it takes them longer to adapt. Doesn't mean they can't, but it takes them longer to adapt. So the ability to to just take it all in, work out what I need to do to be at my best work out how I can have good relationships with my players is really, with the rest of the players is really important. You've always, um, it seemed to me, to take stock and um, take value in what other sports are doing and how other sports are seeing rugby. And, and we know that you, um, you know, you've picked the brains of people in other sports. So <clears throat> when, you, when you're sharing those problems, of you, as you told us that you do, how, how high does selection Quandaries figure figure in those. Oh, selection is always a big one, mate. Yeah, you know, it's the one. I think every, when you meet a group of coaches, the general general discussion would be how do you handle selection? You know, how do you handle the non-selected? How do you handle difficult blokes? Um, how do you tell them they're in or out? Um, and that's a constant theme. You know, it's it's the biggest part of your job. And and for me, still like a Tuesday when I've got to tell the. Th- you know, at least 11 of the 36 players that are not involved on the weekend is still the most difficult assignment for me. You know, I, d- I don't enjoy it at all. Um, but you've got to find a way where you give them hope. Um, if you can give them some hope, then they'll come back and, and, and work hard for the team and try to get in the team. Um, can you remember the first time that you ever had to have a difficult conversation like that, as a, either as a professional coach or even before you were paid to do it? Uh, definitely the most difficult one was uh, David Knox, uh, who I lived, I'd lived with. We played, we played together, lived together, um, you know, had a lot of fun together, and then I became the Brumbies coach, and he was a 36-year-old number 10. I remember he'd been the star the previous year, but he was getting older. And we were having a bad run and I needed to change the team for the next year. Um, and part of that was changing his role from being a starting 10 to being a finishing 10. And that's in fact when we first started, I first had the concept of a finisher. So I said, mate, you can be the best finisher in the world. And he came on, <laughs> he wasn't a great defensive player. He, I can still remember the game, he came on against Queensland, we won at the end of the season. And he made about six tackles in about 10 minutes. <laughs> And, and it, was, it was a really difficult, really difficult conversation because he was a mate of mine and I had to drop him. And then at the end of the year, I had to tell him he had no contract, which is even more difficult. What's easier, when players fire up or when, I think you've said before, sometimes eyes, eyes glaze over? Yeah, well, they're both difficult. Like I've had players um, say to me in no uncertain word that in four letters, you know, you can use your imagination what they're saying, that you're that and I'm going to show you why you're that. And I love that spirit. Um, and then you get other guys who just go quiet. Um, and most, most players go quiet. And then you're just trying to find a way to make, give them hope. You, something you mentioned as well that's actually been echoed subsequently by Sean Edwards, which is quite interesting, is that the next World Cup's going to be... Um, governed by a lot of the unknown and a lot of uncertainty, whether that's referees' interpretations, red and yellow cards, um, concussion layoffs, potentially yep. longer ones of those. How do you, how do you, um, how does selection kind of mitigate for that? Oh, we need adaptable players. You know, it goes back to what we're saying. We need players who can, who can adapt to the situation. Like we had this morning, we were on a scrum machine and um, the scrum machine was too light and, and the ground was slippery, so we were hitting and going down and the players were complaining. And, and Mako Vinopolo said, right, we've got to adapt to this, get your feet underneath you, get close to the machine. And those sort of players are going to be really, really important because, you know, as we know, we had Charlie Yules go off in the first minute of the game, we're down to 14 men, key line-out player, the ability of the players on the field to collaborate make decisions and then follow the decisions is going to be so important. So, so leadership would be an intangible that you'd have to figure in 
the leadership and the followerships so important that you know players need to be able to follow as well. And England is probably that's probably one of the most difficult things because all the the players are big stars in their clubs and they run their clubs. But when they come in here, sometimes they have to take a different role. Yeah. So instead of being at the top of the queue, you're at the back of the queue. Um, and to adjust to that's not easy, but you know, that's, that's why the training that we have before the World Cup is going to be so important. And these November games and the, and the Six Nations games, we're working on those sort of intangible things of the team. Eddie, thanks so much no, pleasure, pleasure. Really appreciate it. Okay, plenty to get stuck into there, Charlie, from a really interesting interview. He, he seemed to, firstly, I guess, he, he seemed quite relaxed and seemed to quite enjoy having a chat with you, which is good. Well it's done. a compliment. <laughs> no, he, he, he was compliment relaxed. I think, he, I think he loves these trading camps. I think he just gets, the, gets these players in one place, um, gets to really dig into the detail with his coaches, and, and that's probably why he was even apologetic. He was slightly late because a coach's meeting overran, so he was just immersed and... Um, you just set him off really he was into the Ed Smith book straight away wasn't he and off he went what were the bits that you, you sort of really took away from it after having that chat with him do you know um, I, th I thought what we saw was actually partly and I mentioned earlier how um, we've had Eddie Jones as England head coach for nearly seven years now and I think in a way we've seen his own personal development and professional development in that time as well which I find fascinating given he's such a high profile and um, successful figure and one one part of that has been his relationship with data, I think. I think he might, I wish that was what you want. You never come away from an interview completely satisfied. I wish I kind of asked him a little bit more about that relationship because I remember one of his crowd-pleasing quotes when he first started was, look, don't pay that much heed to statistics. I just care about how quickly guys get off the ground and get back in the defensive line or something like that. It was a real, and obviously, you know, your eyes are lighting up if you're thinking about column inches when he says something like that. But actually now, you know, he's got a dedicated... Um, company, he was saying, looking into statistics and weighting them according to opponents and all of this quite advanced stuff. And in his book, um, after the last World Cup, he spoke about how James Tozer and Gordon Hamilton Fairley had really influenced him towards, towards the back end of um, 2018 and into 2019 and righted what was a pretty big slump for England and sort of set them on the path to a much, um, much kind of better showing at, at the World Cup to come. So I do. I, I found that really, really interesting because it's just as much as the players have played under the same head coach for seven years, and we've dealt with the same head coach for seven years. He's been developing in that time as as somebody who is you know, kind of restless in in how ambitious and how dedicated he is. Charles, we know he's got a, a ruthless streak because we've seen mm. him hook players in, in first halves of, of test matches during his time with England. But having to ditch your old mate, as he put it, is. Uh, it's pretty brutal, isn't it? Yeah, but then the old it, it worked wonders because the old mate came on and, and made all those tackles, and it was and it was a great success. So you know he's a genius, isn't he, Eddie? So not uh, enough for a contract. At the well, end of the no, year. no, that's true. <laughs> Um, yeah, God, seeing him as a club coach now, he'd be he'd be very ruthless, wouldn't he, with his data on Eddie? Um, yeah, but you know, it, I think it all comes back to I, I was when I was researching going up to Scotland, Australia, and, and, and going up to Murrayfield. I, I looked at the last time that that. Um, that Australia had beaten Scotland, and it, it was it was six years ago, and and in that game, the list of unused replacements in the two team sheets was extensive, and it, it struck me how in six years now it, it's the reverse. If you get an unused replacement in in, in the modern day rugby, um, you're you're surprised by that. You know, you really are surprised by that. At, at the weekend, for instance, um, Thompson didn't get on for Scotland um, because they kept Blair Kinghorn on for the whole game. And uh, and afterwards we were we were asking Gregor Townsend, you know, what was wrong? Why, why didn't he come on? Why didn't he come on? And he was like, no, there was nothing untoward. It was all fine. And and, and Eddie has played into this. We'll hear later when we pick our starting 15s that a lot of the um, a lot of the logic behind them is is in this sort of landscape of rugby now being a 23 man game and. You potentially don't start your best player. You look at you look at what Italy did. That I mean, it was experimental, yes, and it was very pioneering. It might not have worked when they were starting their second choice props, and obviously South Africa have experimented as well with that. But Italy was deliberately starting their second choice props, playing them for half an hour, then unleashing their 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 best their first choice before half time. And I think Eddie and his experiences with, in in Australia has has certainly been you know crucial to that and how rugby has molded into a 23 man game for better or for worse i know that there will be many of you listening who who think that you know it's gone too far the, the wrong way with regard to the impact of the bench um you had a great line in there i, I thought about ignoring 
um, media favourites and players mm. that the media want, which is hilarious because I think even we subconsciously now sort of think, oh, don't pick up a player too much because he just actually won't get picked. And I know fans have said that about their own players as well. They sort of think, oh, that he's doing really well. I wonder if he'll play for England, but don't mention it publicly. Was the original under Eddie Don Armand? Yeah. Like that was, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, the clamour. Uh, uh, yeah, clamor. massive. You should absolutely pick this player. It seems to say to him, "I'm absolutely not going to pick this player," which I do. I do. Yeah, quite do you think like. it is just plain stubbornness? I, I sort of, I sort of respect it in a sense where he's like, "I'm not going to, I'm going to go with the masses on this." Yeah. And um, there is an interesting. I mean, he, his praise for Henry Arundel is also really interesting because Arundel is one of those players, actually, where there has been a lot of hype and a lot of sort of public clamour for him to play, and he has sort of played, and he does keep getting better. He does keep doing well. He, he almost seems like the exception to the rule. Jones says he wants ideally three or more players like that who are sticking their hands up and saying, look at me, look at me, I want to play. It, it feels like there's not actually a lot of time for that to happen. Is, is there anyone sort of in, in mind there that we've got who could do that? Just really quickly, a little mm. detail. He, he pointed to a bush. He said, I want a player to jump out of that bush. And, and this was while the interview was happening. So it was just nice. And, and did they? And they didn't, yeah. Uh, so they were waiting. So maybe maybe during the Ultimate Nationals? Well, there is, know, a, as, as Charlie said, there is a squad update later. So if, there might be a mystery <laughs> player in there. Um, I, I think Aaron, Arundel certainly... I can tell you that Eddie Jones watches games more carefully than me because I was at that Wasps game and, can't, and couldn't remember his that stone-cold drop. Watched it back and box kick's quite a good time with your filing on the whistle, aren't they, to sort of squirrel away and get your uh, get a few sentences pulling back but, the curtain there like that. <laughs> yeah but I'd say Arundel certainly certainly he'd like him to come up on the rails I think there's room for one lock and I think there's room for it almost feels I don't know how you feel Charles having watched him a lot but someone like Jack Van Portfleet his his emergence and his assurance in Australia didn't surprise me at all no. I think Jones would like Rafi Quirk to do something similar because he's a very different and could dovetail very nicely in a 23. Oh, absolutely. I think there's a great balance between those two nines. I mean, personally now, as we'll find out later in the show, I, I would I would start Jack Van Portfleet for, for that extra control and just for, for the control that he brought to the game in Australia and, and for the pace that he played at, I, I thought he was superb. But, but Rafi Quirk is also a superb nine. I love watching him play. He was fantastic last season for England. Uh, and I'd have him exploding off the bench at, at, at 50 minutes. Somebody, you, you've already written about this, Charlie, but somebody who could jump out the bush um, for, for Eddie, but it's, it's somebody, uh, somebody that is no stranger to him, could be Dan Cole, who is playing some superb stuff for Leicester. And if you're picking a, you know, Will Stewart could be out for, for, for a long while. There are only two tight heads in this squad. If you need a third, you know, there is, there is a real chance that, that, that Cole could be in for a, a, a remarkable resurgence and a remarkable comeback with England, really. So he'd, be, he'd personify what I'm talking about, about having gone around that World Cup cycle already mm. before. As somebody that he doesn't... Dan Cole's going to do a job. Yeah. He knows that. Absolutely. That, that was kind of what... Um, I think he, he got asked about it um, at a press session a while back, uh, Jones, after, I think, at the weekend that um, Cole had gone so well against Saints for Leicester. And that's another... He's another player, mile of the same. Th- these guys that are so experienced, just know themselves... As well, so well more than anything, mm. and just he can kind of slot them back in if these guys like Hayes, if he just feels that they need a little bit more kind of bolstering. The, fe- the feather in Dan's cap is that he's keeping Joe Hayes out of the out of the Leicester starting fifteen at the minute, and Joe Hayes is the is is going to be the second or potentially first choice tight head this autumn. Well, so you know, it sounds like he. Might, I mean, let's get into the selection because Joe Hayes might actually be your tight head. So we've between the three of us, we've had a go at picking a fifteen for Sunday. Obviously, certain players aren't available. So I think if we just... We'll just quickly go through position by position. I think that's easy. So if we start with fullback, I've gone with Freddie Stewart. Charlie? I've gone with Freddie Stewart. Charles? Ditto. Okay. Any other, Anyone else there who, who feasibly... I think you... unless he wants Farrell at 10. I think if he wants Farrell at 10, he will look at um, someone like George Furbank, someone like Max Malins, and maybe even shift steward to the wing which is going to infuriate everybody but might be just an option just to get Malins and or Fairbank on the field and give him that second distributor I think we spoke about that we quite like the idea well not the idea we could see, could have seen Arundel at fullback and steward on the wing Arundel isn't going to be around um, let, let's chat wings then I've got Jack Noel and Max Malins which feels very solid if not very spectacular Charlie who have you got? Gone Noel I've actually written all. I've written four names down next to eleven, which is pathetic. But I think <laughs> I've gone. Um, why not Radwan? Throw Radwan in just because I think his 
he gives England a real ceiling, real high ceiling, given given his pace. Charles, how about you? Uh, I also have gone Noel because he's going great, great guns for Exeter this season, um, and I've I, I tossed and turned a bit, a bit like Charlie with the, with the extra with the right wing spot, and I've gone Murley because I think. You know he's been playing very very well, and I think his his call up is significant because we've we've always said that he's one of the Premiership's best wings, and he wasn't being picked for for international, and now it feels like the timing is right. This is one of those things that you sort of everybody says, and I don't and it sort of have no no substance to it at all. But I guarantee if Merle and Noel are on the same pitch together, they go, oh, do you think they're just a bit similar? Mm. And I don't know what that means. Mm. Are they too similar to play in the same I team? I do. I, I do like Merle's pace. I do like Merley's finishing ability. I think he would you hand him a first cap? Maybe. I, uh, this is the. I mean, this is the dilemma, isn't it? I think because Johnny Mays held down one of those wing spots for so long, whether he should have done or not, you're now in a position where you're wondering who's going to take his place. I mean, they're they're going both to come excellent in. in the air as well. well that's true. And, that, that, and we know how important that is. That is true. Is. Just to cover all bases. Stewart, Stewart, Noel, and fucking a singer was the was the back three for the first test at Australia, mm. and he can he can just go back to that if he wants to. That is mm. true. Um, centres, uh, this is where I, I think our back lines will get interesting. I've got Farrell and two Laggy. Charles, who have you got? Um, I have Porter at 12, Guy Porter of Leicester at 12, and Manu Twilangi at 13. Talk to me about Guy Porter. Um, I think he was excellent for Leicester last season and completely justified his, his call up to the England to the England tour of Australia, where he, he barely put a foot wrong, really. you know, He was very, very solid. Uh, admittedly, Admittedly, England in that area might want more than solidity, but I'd love to see him play with with, with Manu alongside him. I really would. I mean, he, Manu gives most an armchair ride, and I really would like to see him play at twelve. He's he's a he's a real combative runner. He's very elusive. He's very deceptively strong. He's a bit sort of Lazowski in that regard, but even stronger, I would say, um, in terms of his strength. But but then, with all that, I would have Farrell at fly half. Um, because I think that they're, it's a bit square pegs round holes at the minute with, with Farrell and Smith for me. I, I think Farrell is, a, is, is an exceptional fly half. Um, I don't think he's a 12. Um, so, and, and I think he brings far, far more to that England team than just his fly half ability. I think his leadership is outstanding. It, the last 10 minutes for Saracens against Bath a couple of weeks ago, he was otherworldly. You know, Mark McCall hinted at it after the game, but... I mean, I really think that Saracens would have lost that game without him, such as his importance. And I think he's he has that importance on this England team. I would have him at fly half, and I'd have Smith off the bench if it was all going pear shaped. Charlie, who are your centres quickly? I'm, I'm really intrigued by Farrell at ten, but I've, I, I also want to see Smith foul too laggy again. We've sure, only, we've only got a few minutes. I, that. I've got I've got Smith at ten as well. I want to see a bit more Smith and Farrell. I'm not giving up on it yet, even if it doesn't work. Um, scrum half. I think we've all got Jack Van Portfleet. I've got Jack Van Portfleet. Charles? I've got Jack Van Port. Say no more. Um, Lou said, we've all got Ellis Genge? Yep. God, I thought someone was going to say no there, and I would have been a bit cocky. Um, Hooker? Cowan Dickey, if he's there. Um, Ditto. Cowan Dickey. Bit Cow- sticky Cow- if he's Dickey. not. Yeah, Cowan Dickey, if he's there. If not, George McGuigan? I think Looks so. Have to be. Yeah, maybe. And then Singleton. Tight head. I've got Carl Sinclair. Double, double Joe Hayes? Double Joe Hayes, Hayes over here, Charlie and Charles do- Joe Hayes double. For, for, for no other reason than I don't think Sinclair's been playing very well this season. I mean, that's it. And maybe, you know, leaving him on the bench for England this autumn might be the um, sort of kick up the proverbial that he might need. I think I think Joe Hayes has been has been excellent when he's come off the bench for England. He's always excellent when he comes off the bench for Leicester. Um, and I don't think Carl Sinclair's playing his best rugby at the minute. But it should be Dan Cole. Is that what, is that what you're telling well, me? I'd certainly have Dan Cole in and around the squad, yeah. OK, OK. Uh, let's do the locks. I feel like the locks sort of pick themselves. It's OJ. Yeah. Who's your other one? Hill. 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 Three hills. Well, that was easy. Back row, back row is where it gets interesting. I'm going to flip it. Who are the number rates that you've got first? I've got I've got Billy Vinopola there. You've got Billy. I also have Billy Vinopola. So we've all, got, we've all got Billy, but I think it's the flankers where it gets interesting because... You are struggling to lose, aren't you? I mean, it's uh, there are a lot of options there I've and got, a lot of strong combinations. I, I've got to be honest. I like this team. I don't. I don't love it, and I've picked it myself, so it shows what a great coach I would be. But I'm not sort of <laughs> not sort of looking at it and getting excited. I, I, for the record, have got Ludlam at six, Curry at seven, and it's well. I was going to say it's captain. Actually, that's not true because it'd be Farrell. So Ludlam and Curry. Charlie, who have you got? Curry six, Willis seven. Curry, Curry and Willis. Charles, who have you got? I also have Curry and Willis. I do like the idea of unleashing Jack Willis. Talk to me quickly why that would be great fun. 
Well, I think, I mean, he's phenomenal over the ball. And I think what we might see from England is a lot of kicking. They've, they've sort of said that they're not going to show their hand, which is a real good way to drum up excitement before a series. But um, I think they're going to rely on a lot of break, breakdown spoiling, which is what Jack Willis is excellent at. He's coming in, he's probably just fine, having found his feet at the back end of last season after such a catastrophic injury. He's now finding his feet again. And just the story of him going as an unattached player he spoke so well and actually so poignantly in Jersey about what that felt like losing his job um, along with everybody at Wasps um, that it's really hard not to want him to do well. I yeah. think he would. I think it would be a lovely story. Yeah, Willis brackets unattached is going to look quite wild on a team sheet, but then it's been an odd <laughs> season. Um, great, those are our teams. Next up, we will preview uh, this weekend's test matches. Sorry, mate, that was a bit long. Okay, good, good, good night, I think. I think um, Leicester announcing Charlie Atkinson. No way. Are they? Okay. Oh, I wonder I said it had all gone quiet. Um, so we'll start with Arge, and then... Do you want to do... Do you want to chat about France Oz first? Yeah. You're going to be there. I, I'll segue to Charlie. Charles, you're going to be in France. Cobb, you're going to be in France. Cobby. Um, and then... <clears throat> yeah. Okay. Ready? Let's look ahead then to this weekend's games in the Autumn Nation series. Uh, let's start with England Argentina on Sunday. We've we've touched on the England team, but let's talk a bit about Argentina um, and actually let's talk about Michael Checker's diary because is he, am I right in saying that he's going to be with Lebanon either the day before or like a couple of days before at the Rugby League World Cup? Alternating days, I think, over the week. Yeah. Right. His diary's full. Is what it is? <laughs> what can we expect from? Argentina after a pretty good year and they and their players in the Premiership are certainly playing well. Also, I, I, I had to remind myself this week that Mateo Carreras, who plays for Newcastle and who scores wonder tries, and Santiago Carreras, who plays for Gloucester, are not related. Oh, no. They are not brothers. They just have the same surname. So that's my fun fact. And what else have you got about Argentina? They're just so... They're going to be so tough and gnarly yeah. and... There's just always that element of the, f the f fiery, aren't there? There was that, was that game in 2017 where Elliot Daly got sent off. Might have been 2000. No, it was 2017. Um, for aerial, aerial kind of it took out one of their wingers. And actually, they were they were pretty poor that day. But there were still a couple of red cards. And Creevy and Creevy and Dan Cole actually had a bit of a set to, which oh, was yeah. really just really fun. Um, so they're going to bring that bring that um, that kind of tenacity. I think their back line looks really really nicely balanced as well, and that could really really trouble England I think as I say I think England will not want to show too much which may mean that they spend a lot of time without possession and I think actually against Argentina that could be quite dangerous because you've got Carreras just playing amazingly for sorry the Santiago this yeah is, yeah, yeah and he, he's, he's like to be at 10 right so yeah yeah, yeah. speaking to George Skimmington afterwards because he, he was great on the wing on Friday night against Exeter Skimmington said he will definitely be at 10 against England which which seems to work for them Gloucester don't fancy it but it works for it works for Argentina mm. Charles what are you sort of expecting from Czechos Pumas well tenacity as ever up front I think um, uh, Marco Kremer might might well be out I think he's suspended which is a big loss for them because he's shame, superb though. superb for them always at um, on the flank and, and in all their big wins actually over the past couple of years you think when they beat New Zealand he's always been one of the best players if not the best player on the field in Julian Montoya at Hooker, obviously they have one of the best in the world there. And up front, they are just going to be granite. Uh, and England are going to have to be very, very good to get an upper hand there. I think behind the pack, although Argentina will be very, very strong as they are, I think that is where England might fancy their chances and fancy themselves a little bit. I think if they can get parity up front, then then the opportunities are going to be there in behind. Although saying that, you know, they... I mean, there's a chance that they'll start Moroni, Matthias Moroni, who's well known to Leicester and Newcastle fans at 13, who's one of, if not the best defensive outside centre in the world. So you know, may maybe not. It might be everyone going to Twickenham on, on Sunday is going to see England kick the leather off it. I desperately want to see Montoya and Gus Creevy in some sort of like body cop movie because they've sort of been like master and apprentice, but now Montoya's captain and Creevy's like the old hand just in the background coming <laughs> off the bench at 37 just to like guide him along. Love that partnership. Yeah. Um, realistically, Argentina, I sort of feel, have got a pretty decent chance, actually, to win this and to go to Twickenham and cause a, roughly a few feathers, having 
you know, played together fairly recently in the rugby championship. What, what about you guys? It's, it's an interesting way that the autumn set up for England, isn't it? Because you, on paper, it would be you're looking to kind of ease your way in before you play New Zealand and South Africa at the end of the season, but end of the sorry the series. But they're banana skins for sure. Those two those two games, not least because of how Japan went against uh, New Zealand, which was really exciting. Um, and also, you've got the subplot. Not to sound too, um, not to kind of eat out of Eddie Jones's hand as far as a narrative. The the fact that they're two they're sharing the group with um, with those two nations at the World Cup is is just a really interesting subplot in it all. Yeah, definitely. Um, Charles, you are going to be in Paris this weekend for France yeah. against Australia. Is that exciting? Yeah, I mean, I need, I need no second um, invitation to go over there, but it, it won't be quite be as glamorous as it sounds because I'm on the. Um, the early morning Eurostar over, and it's a 9 p.m. kickoff local time. So that's, you know, g- going to be fun, going to be late back. But yeah, I am, I'm really looking forward to it. Obviously, France lost that series in 2021 down under t- to the Wallabies. So there's unfinished business there. Um, although, admittedly, they did take a sort of second slash third choice squad. They do have a few injuries. Gabin Villiers on the wing, who's a phenomenal talent. Uh, Melvin Jaminet, their starting fullback, is also out. Um, and Cyril Bay is, is just coming back from an injury. The, the reports in the French press this morning are that he's touch and go and that he might come off the bench, but they still look so outstandingly strong. You know, just looking down some of these names, that you've got Julien Marchand at Hooker, who is, uh, again, pushing Julien, uh, Julien Montoya as one of the best in the world. Their back row is going to be um, Charles Olivon, the, the former captain, at seven, Anthony Jalonch at six, and Gregory Aldrit at, um, at number eight. Uh, and then obviously you're going to have Dupont and Tamak, or the usual suspects, Penno. Um, it's mad to think they had so much success without Olivon. Yeah, mad. Mm. And 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 they are they're also Dupont is going to be captain. So they've, they've, they've Olivon has relinquished the captaincy. But but just comparing them to England slightly on that front, um, there was an interview with uh, Antoine Dupont in in, in Midi Olympique, the, the the French rugby newspaper, uh, last week. Um, where he was, they asked him about whether he felt embarrassed to sort of regain the captaincy with with Charles Olivon, who's there, the former captain, who sort of was the captain at the start of Fabien Galtier's run, and he said, "No, not at all, because we've got this such this strong leadership group in in in, uh, in the squad with with Julian Marchand, with Charles, with with Gael Ficou, and and, and with and with Antamac and Gregory Aldrit." They've got leaders coming out of their ears, and it is interesting the sort of when you juxtapose that with England, how we're sitting here going, "Ooh, who who could captain England?" How they've got candidates everywhere. Mm-hmm. Charles, I'm going to come to you again on Scotland versus Fiji, just because you've seen Scotland in the flesh. Um, are you expecting a bit of a, a bit of a bounce back kind of performance? Do you, I, I remember Fiji, Fiji last November in Cardiff, caused where was loads of problems for a bit, and then Wales sort of pulled it out of the bag. Will it be one of those? Do you think? Um, perhaps. They showed potential Scotland on Saturday. I think this is a a risk-free game almost in terms of selection for Gregor Townsend. I think he could make quite a few changes to his team from last weekend and say, well, if if it doesn't go so well, then it, we had a lot of disruption. I, I changed a lot so we could see more players. And if it goes really well, then actually going on to New Zealand and Argentina, those last two games, those guys may well find that they've got the jersey. For instance, at, at 10, Blair Kinghorn, you know, as you've written this morning, Blair Kinghorn missed that late penalty and, and, and no one's going to blame him for that kickers miss kicks all the time um, but he blew hot and cold ball in hand during the match and I, I, I mean I've always maintained that Adam Hastings is the best prospect for Scotland at 10 and I think that he was unavailable last weekend because he plays in the Premiership he plays for Gloucester but, but I think this weekend would be the, the time to really unleash him and, and give him that 10 jersey and if it, if it goes fantastically then he's got his starting 10 for New Zealand because he's left Finn Russell out of the squad of course very very high profile mission and if it doesn't go well then, then Kinghorn's back in and, and he can come in and, and be the saviour after, after the late miss on last weekend Yeah for sure um, I'll, I'll chat quickly about Wales v New Zealand which really sort of intrigues I don't think it's the game of the weekend but it really intrigues me just because the All Blacks against Japan, you watched and they were okay? They were clunky. I, th- I think that their selection didn't necessarily show a lot of respect to Japan. I think in years gone by, they've been able to rotate a lot and still pump Japan. And that they just they looked clunky for all those changes, the All Blacks. And they were even, you know, they were missing a white lock, one white lock, three Barretts, and um, and Yuani and Surveyor. So clearly, well remembered. That was so very clearly, good. very, very good players. But Japan put them under pressure throughout with their phase play. Japan actually, the first two New Zealand tries were pretty iffy. One really skewed line out, one forward pass. Um, and Japan were clearly, which is really exciting for, for England's game after the weekend, they were clearly looking to push boundaries with their offloading game. Mm. Um, 
which says to me that they're looking ahead to 2023 and really seeing how much they can squeeze out of their attack. So actually, yeah, well, long story short, if Wales... Wales aren't going to have many better chances to, to put one over on New Zealand. I swear we said that last year and then they got absolutely yeah, thrashed in that game then they <laughs> conceded 50 points. Yeah, Wales are in an interesting place just because of injuries. There's no Dan Bigger. Um, they're sort of sweating on George North, I think. Sweating on Josh Adams, I think. At least they have Lewis Reese Amit, who was great fun against X2 the other night. Seems to be in some Jeez, of his best shot. form. And, he, you know, and he, he, didn't, he didn't play in that All Blacks game last year. And he said on on Friday when we spoke to him that he can't wait like he's, he's always wanted to do it he can't wait to face the All Blacks it's a bit of a tall order for Wales but but I don't know it, it's going to be really interesting autumn for Wayne Pivak and seeing how they develop Tipperick, Rafael double act I mean I love some Tommy Rafael and that debut was well overdue in the summer so sign me up for more of that and Tipperick is captain Will, Will Rowlands and Adam Beard for me a nice lot partnership keeping Alan Wynne jones out the side yeah it's it's interesting it's interesting Um, which brings us finally to probably the game of the weekend which is Ireland Against South Africa, Razi Razi returns to Ireland and Wales number one side. Number one side, Ireland. I got that yep, right. Yep, yeah, yep, number yep. one side in the world against the world champions. Who wins it, boys? Who wins? Lovely quote from Andy Farrell about being number one that he wants them to embrace it in a very non-Celtic, stroke British sort of way. That's really not what um, you men do, is it? <laughs> you men sort of cower and want to be yeah, the be underdog. But yeah. But he said, no, let's, 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 let's embrace it, see how far it gets us. Charles was talking at the beginning of this about teams, test teams, kind of profiles, tactical profiles. And in this game, you've got two of the kind of polar opposites, haven't you? Um, you've got a side that love kick pressure, love breakdown pressure in, in South Africa. And you've got a team that want to build that pressure through phase play and through those intricate patterns in Ireland. And that's what makes this just really fascinating. Don't think they've played since 2017. Yeah, I find that wild. No, that's, that's just yeah. weird scheduling, isn't it? That yeah. Somehow they haven't crossed paths in about well, five, they, five they years. They due to play in the COVID year as well, perhaps. Well, yeah, oh, yeah, po- yeah, possibly, yeah. yeah. It's, it's still a, a, very, a very meaty gap. Mm. Uh, but yeah, f- fascinating by that game. Um, next up, uh, big news down in def- down under for England. I'll try, start that again. Big news down under for England's women. Uh, they picked up their 29th consecutive win to move into the semi-finals of the rugby world. The women's rugby. Uh, let me do that whole bit again. Big news down under for England's women. They picked up their 29th consecutive win to move into the semi-finals of the rugby world cup. Fiona Thomas is there for the Telegraph, and we're going to hear from her about how they got on. There's been a lot of things said about this England side, just how, how clinical they are near the try line, how dominant their forward pack in particular is. What's clear, I think, when you look at England play in the pack, that like, everyone is singing from the same song sheet. They are a ridiculous force that cannot be stopped. It is their, it is their weapon. And in terms of England's game against Canada, you know, I think, I think the easy thing is to, to just say, look, England, England's forward power will simply overwhelm Canada. It will be too much. But if you look at Canada, they're a bit of a sort of maverick side, if one of the better word to use. They've got formidable front row in Emily Tutosi, Olivia de Merchant and Delika Menon, who ironically have all played for Exeter Chiefs at various points in their careers. Um, and that's a theme that kind of generally runs through the Canadian side. They've got a lot of players who have honed their craft in, in the Premier 15s. Um, and one of them is Sophie de Goudier, uh, their number eight, who is just a ridiculously brilliant player. Her mum was also a Canadian international, so rugby runs in the family. She's definitely one to watch. That They're going to pose a different challenge, and, and one which kind of England haven't really kind of faced before, but I, I just think... England are going to prevail. They're, they're just, they've got eyes on that vinyl. They're dealing with the pressure and as, uh, you know, being the, the favourites as just fine right now. All the signs are saying one thing, that they're going to they're going to get the final and they're going to, I don't know, potentially smash it. I don't want to jinx it, though. OK, great to hear from Fiona down in New Zealand about uh, how the Rebel World Cup is going and how, England, how well are England are playing. Um, the, the weather in, in Wangarai was absolutely horrendous there's a great clip that i think emily scarrett put up on her instagram this morning of her uh rinsing out her sock at half time <laughs> sort of outside the changing room with the caption i've never had to do this before which just sort of just sums up how just brutal the weather was and and we've uh, england's pack is is obviously one really really impressive unit and that laid the framework for their for their victory didn't it charlie they're, they're just you know the way they're playing at the moment they just look immense and very tough team to beat. Very tough team. A lot of that is because of the variety. 
we hear a lot about them more than how or hope hope that they have more than that when you have a mall and you have the variety of options that they have off it because they've got so many really super clever forwards um you know epitomized by by sarah hunter um that just get, that allows you to break down teams in so many different ways. And towards the back end of their their pool game against South Africa, we saw that phase play. We saw a lot of a lot of those intricate ball movements. I think I, no, only one back scored a try in that in that thrashing. But still, um, you know, the ball movement was there and looked look really really good. So, however, having said that, I think I think they'll get through the semi final against Canada. I think whoever they play in the final, whether it's whether it's New Zealand or or France, um, I think that game. Even though it'll be a final, I think whoever plays England will be obviously going in with this underdog tag. And if that game gets slightly unstructured, um, New Zealand's back three, especially they've shoehorned Ruby Tui into that back three, and it has not backfired as as sometimes those kind of selection gambles can do. They just look superb. They're, the pullbacks they're making from their forwards so zippy, and that's just giving the guys, giving their players out wide so much room to just cause havoc basically. So if that final. Um, not wishing to look kind of too far ahead, but if that final becomes too a little bit unstructured, I think we could see England tested in a way that they haven't been tested since the last World Cup, and that is really intriguing. Clearly, their staff are super diligent. They would have been um, looking forward to that. They would have been kind of making making tweaks in training and really thinking about how they can stretch their players. However, it's going to be a step into the unknown that final. So you think New Zealand as hosts are going to do the business against France? They've, they've with looked, France without Law Sanchez. Yeah, I just think they've looked devastating. Fr- that Fr- that France England game was really interesting. I think England going into the tournament with such a big winning streak, it always felt as if some point that they were going to feel a little bit claustrophobic um, surrounding the kind of expectation that they justifiably kind of generated on their own. But it it was to their credit that they managed to win that game despite kind of it being a very clunky game and despite France defending so brilliantly and, and shutting them down. Um, they've got through that and it's whether now they feel free or whether that kind of feeling um, kind of dawns upon them again at some point during the knockout stages. Yeah, I don't want to misquote Simon Middleton, but, I did, but he did say before the tournament, we've got the best prepared squad, the best depth we could ask for and we've got to win it. And it does sort of... It does feel that way. This unbeaten run is remarkable. So they haven't lost in 29 games, and the last time was against New Zealand in San Diego in 2019. It's just an extraordinary run that they're on. And we should quickly chat about Sarah Hunter as well. Incredible achievement winning her 138th cap. I love that photo that we had in Fiona's excellent Telegraph story where I think Sarah's playing like under nines rugby and, and basically just fending off about Swatting four off or that, five yeah. other kids yeah. who were just sprawled on the grass. It's just fantastic. It, it, remarkable achievement from a hell of a player. Yeah, Jen, she's, as I say, she's just that cornerstone of that pack. They've got so many phenomenal players. Marley Packer, you know, Zoe Allcroft, like these, these, brilliant, these brilliant back five players and they're going to be if England do go all the way, that pack is going to be the um, the cornerstone of it. Yeah, definitely. I, I just one other bit of skill that stood out from that game, given the weather was so bad, was a pretty slick pass from Zoe Harrison, just like a little no look to Marley Packer as she was about to get crunched by two tacklers. Like you know, there is. The, I know the pack's getting a lot of attention, but there's a lot of skill there as well. And they, yeah, they look a very, very, very impressive side ahead of the semi-finals. Right, that's it for today. Uh, Thanks to everyone who has downloaded this episode and a reminder that we will be here throughout the autumn bringing you the latest from the England camp and beyond. We'll also be exploring a different theme each week and next week I think we're going to be looking at the attack so please tune in for that and later on we'll have episodes on refereeing and also the set piece. If you have any questions for us ahead of those episodes please do get in touch with us at rugbypod at telegraph.co.uk and we will do our best to answer them for you in next week's podcast. In the meantime, if you haven't already subscribed to the podcast, you can do that now from wherever you are listening to us today. Myself, Charlie and Charles, we'll all be back with you next week. Until then, goodbye.